Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this instalment of uh, Ludwig Nation. My name's Les Hornry. We're here in downtown Charlestown. We're here in uh, Newcastle, and I'm with a, uh, a long-time uh, Ludwig fisherman, uh, Warwick. Introduce yourself to the uh, viewers, Warwick. Yeah, I'm Warwick Neal. I've been fishing pretty well for Ludwig over the last 40 years. Learned from uh, my father and uh, still learning. Yes, uh, one of the good things about uh, anything, mainly fishing, is that you never stop learning, is there? There's always something new to learn. That's right, especially uh, I'm on uh, several blackfish sites on, through the internet and you always learn something from a person that's more practical than what you are. Nice. Well, we're actually here in uh, Warwick's uh, shed when we come down here today. Have a quick chat to him. won't take long. Uh, part of uh, what we're doing as a Ludwig Nation is where we want to basically inform the new generation. We want to talk to the younger guys and we want to basically try and uh, get them into this art of uh, black fishing, something that you and I have been involved in our, and our fathers and fathers before that. And I have a 22-year-old son and... Uh, and he uh, potentially would probably rather be on the PlayStation, but he has shown an interest and I want to try and pass some of this knowledge on. So uh, your father took you out uh, Ludric fishing and um, was it uh, love at first sight or did you uh, a bit apprehensive uh, to, to take it up early? Oh, I felt I was apprehensive because I had other interests and that being um, sailing and also scouting. Okay, so of course you like the water? Yes. Yeah, nice. And um, so your father, was he a good teacher or just basically sat you on a rock and said, uh, son, watch this, or did you get your hands dirty right from the start? He was a, a sit on the rock and watch what I do. Yeah, I think as part of that generation, I'm sure my father did the same. Yeah. And I would have thought that uh, Warwick would have been using similar gear. I know the gear uh, that we're using now, the technology's come a long way, but but realistically, it's the same gear, isn't it? It is the same gear, same style in floats. Uh, what has changed is the type of materials used in rod building and, of course, materials in uh, uh, reels. And we're going to have a look at uh, some of these uh, floats here today, but just explain... In your terms, wh why do we even need a float? Like, what, what, what is the, it, you know, what's the reason for the float? In a lot of other fishing, we, we don't have a float. We have a hook and we have a sinker and a bait. But what's the, what's, the, what's the float do? Well, what the float does is it detects the blackfish bite, which, which is not actually a bite, is a suck. He draws the bait in and you fish as light as you can and the float is a detector of the... The bite. Yeah, and it also does it, it keeps the bait up, up off the ground like a normal sinker who just wants yeah. to put the bait ground straight onto the sand or whatever. Yeah, you can you set your depth. Yeah. You know, sometimes you might fish five feet or 25 feet. And and where are we where are we fishing for the little drink? Well, what's the sort of, not specifically the exact location, but generally where are we fishing for them? Uh, over the last 12 months, going back to the last winter period when the, the run starts and they start to swarm and school up, I've been fishing uh, Nelson's Bay. Yeah. It's an hour's run from here, but you virtually can guarantee your bag. Yeah, and the, and that's on a rock wall of some sort, is it you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah a, a small breakwater yeah. up near the marina. So if I've got this right, we're fishing uh, on the break wall or on the wall. We've got the bait out a certain way, but we're keeping the bait up off the ground using the float and just floating it past the rocks. That's yeah, what we're doing. And that's done with the run of the tide. Yeah, so what's the best uh, tide to be fishing if you could? I mean, it's a, it's a daytime sport, isn't it? Like it it's, it's, yeah, you've got to see the float. Yeah. <laughs> you can uh, fish overnight with yeah. little starlights on top. But it's mainly daylight. Yeah, yeah. And uh, depends where you are. Sometimes they, they're a moody fish. They will bite on the run-up tide or the run-back 
or not till the top of the tide mm. or the bottom of the tide. So should you be worried too much about the tide? No, because you're going to there to enjoy yourself. Yeah. Sit and watch a float. If you get a fish, it's a big bonus. Yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, what... The, I think the thing that I fell in love with was there's something to do while you're fishing. There was actually a purpose you could watch the float. That's right. That's where a lot of other fishing, you throw it out, you might as well just read a book or go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. But uh, to be able... So let's get on to some of these floats. So um, what uh, drove you to... or made you think about actually making your own floats? Because I imagine in the early days you would have um, decided to buy your floats. I did. Uh, my father never ever made his floats. He had a mate that made them for him. And uh, I put a uh, few pictures up on the blackfish sites to where I caught some nice ludric and a chap uh, rang me up and said... Um, who made the float? And I said, it was one of mine. And this started way back in May last year. Yeah. And I've been making them every since, ever since, um, out of different materials, and uh, enjoying making them, enjoy using them, and making them for other people. And um, I, I think it's... Uh it's one of the attractive parts of the fish. Like, you know, you see a picture of, and I see your pictures online, which is, which is one of the reasons I'm here talking to you. It's just, it looks like a peacock feather. It's, like, it's just a, it's a beautiful array of colours. And I know you've got some natural ones here, some green and some natural. We're going to get into what you make them out of, but they can come in all colours, can't they? Yeah, all, um, all the colours I use on the tips are a fluorescent uh, paint. And uh, tell me a little about why they they call a pencil float. A pencil float, which I've got a couple hidden somewhere, yeah. but they're, I don't. They're just like a stick. Yeah, they yeah. are. So what would you call these uh, floats? Cork float or a, uh, oh, just a, bu a bulb style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, why do they look like they are? Is it just traditional that that's what they've looked traditional. like? Traditional. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Could, could you potentially just use a round bobble float? Yeah, and some people do. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard now lately a lot of people, some people using flies so they don't use a float at all. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. But um, let's uh, get into a little bit about uh, what you're making them out of here. I see you've got a couple of different designs here. On the Grab these ones here and take us through this one here and show us what, uh, what you're making these particular floats out of. Well, I start off with a three-quarter square piece of balsa wood. Yes. To where I drill a hole and put that stainless steel mandrel in, which is attached to my drill. Yep. We might have a look at that a bit later. But yeah. So you start with a square piece of... Square uh, piece. Yeah. And you whittle that down with then a you, po pocket then, knife. Then you, that's turned in the drill, and that's the shape I'm after. Being a little bit larger at the top and uh, tapered tape at the bottom. Tapered at the bottom. Yep. So there's no resistance in the water. And then, of course, you've got to get a stick in the middle. What's that one? What's the stick made out of? Uh, bamboo. Okay. And then uh, you're up for painting. Uh, well, the finished one. Yeah. And that, uh, as you can see there, ladies and gentlemen, let me just have a quick look into the bottom. So traditionally, these wouldn't have been um, connected, the eyelets like this. No, know? though... Uh, a lot of fishermen these days um, still bind the fitting on. Yeah. Where, where I don't, I glue the fitting and then a material called heat shrink oh, so over the top. That's an electronic uh, type heat shrink, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And you get your hairdryer it's, out? Yeah. No, you're not a bit <laughs> stronger than a hairdryer. The type I use uh, shrinks at 125 degrees. So that's your balsa wood one. So you make them out of cork as well? Yeah, wine bottle corks. So you got, uh, which one you got there? You got the... A single cork. Yeah. To where that one has already been drilled and near shaped. I see. And the finished article. Beautiful. Let's get a look at him. So that's, that's your cork there. And then that's the uh, finished article. So obviously... Uh, you're lacquering them with some sort of some sort of lacquer? Yeah. 
I soil all the floats with uh, very simple, expensive concrete soiler. Okay, do you? Nice. Yeah, I normally put two, two to three coats of concrete soiler. Yeah. And then three coats of lacquer. Yeah, nice. And then the last one we're looking at here is basically uh, you stick a couple of corks two corks together. joined together. Okay. To make it longer in the body. So it helps to be a red wine drinker? Yeah. <laughs> You're probably making more floats than you can drink. No, drink not wine. really. I have uh, two restaurants uh, save all my corks for oh, me. Oh, nice. And, uh, and therefore, you put them up on sale just um, on some of these uh, groups in the Facebook. And, uh, I do. And um, do you think they're of good value? Uh, you can't get for the you can't get back for the time you put in to make a float. Yeah, yeah. You, you're not you're not here to make some money out of it. No, no, no. Because when the fishing season starts, I turn off the float making, <laughs> and you head out doing some fishing. <laughs> and do you have a favourite yourself? Do you, do you use your own floats? I should say. Yeah, he's got. Uh, he's pointing up here to um, a few a few floats up the top here. I'll basically just take you across here. This is his uh, blackfish rigs here, and he's got a few. And as you can see, he's got his own, using his own product, which is always good to see, <laughs> someone using their own product. So it's really just an enjoyment thing. It, it is. Yeah. And uh, I would like to see more, as you said earlier, younger fellas into it. Yeah. Um, I was only notified this week that um, one of our real professional float makers, Michael Johnson from Wollongong, yeah. uh, he's up here in seven weeks' time and himself and myself are going to meet for the first time. Nice. Uh, I've backed my floats against his, but uh, he's putting his young son, who's seven years old, yeah. uh, up against both of us as a Ludwig uh, fisherman. So uh, it's going to be a float off. Yeah, that's a good one. Do you um, do you think the fish know any difference with the floats? Uh, they do if it's not balanced properly. Yeah, and the colours. They do, do they do, have you heard over time that some of your floats doing better than others to do with colours? No, no, not a, uh, the colours is a, a sight uh, assistance as far as the tips go. Yeah, yeah. But what's in the water? To me, it doesn't make any difference. And you can see some of these, most of them have these uh, striping effects because you want to be able to see when they're in the level in the water, whether they're going up or down. Uh, if you just had a solid colour, maybe you wouldn't be able to t detect really exactly what was happening on the float. But as you can see here, there's a lot of change of colour. There's a lot of uh, markings on these on these particular floats. So... That helps to be able to find out whether it's gone under or not, I suppose. Yeah, it does when the fish are biting timid. Yeah. Uh, as far as the colours go, uh, it depends on the weather. Okay. Um, on the bright days, I like to use the reds or the orange, but the dull days, the actual yellow stands right out. And we've all, fishing for Ludwig, we understand that when the float goes under, it goes under. And a lot of times, you know, you get a good strike. It's not just, uh, you don't see any of these colours. The, the float is no, well under. It's gone. Yeah, yeah. Depends how the fish bite. If they're biting timid, they may even not pull the float under. Yeah, I must admit, uh, last uh, couple of weekends I went, uh, went out and uh, it, the, the float was just tipping over. Just actually tipping. It wasn't actually coming down. So I was... Yeah, and there was a fish on that. So yeah, this happens. Yeah, they'll they'll won't pull the float down. They'll run the float. And just uh, overall, the, the blackfish um, rig, and we're talking about uh, bait, of course. Uh, one of those things that you just can't go to the store, or you haven't been able traditionally to go to a a bait store and and roll up and grab a some bait out of the freezer. Uh, what's your preferred bait? Fresh bait. Yeah. Uh, there's several types of uh, stringy weed off the ocean front and or fresh water. But uh, my favourite would be a brackish water uh, stringy type weed, what we call wire weed.
Okay, so just a bit more coarse. It is. Yeah. And uh, the cabbage you're using for some burley maybe, or you're still using some cabbage no, as your bait? I usually fish one cabbage, one weed. Okay, just to break it up a bit. Yes. And do you, if you're getting a down, do you just stay on whatever it is that you're yeah, getting down? If they're preferring one to the other, that's what you stick with. Well, I noticed on your rig, uh, Warren, that you had a double hook. Do you put weed on one and cabbage, cabbage on, on the, the other hook? I do. Wow. And you have those different lengths too, yeah. don't you? Mine's about seven inches yeah, yeah. between. And uh, you've always fished with a double hook? I have. Some fishermen get into a bit of trouble casting with single leads where one comes back and wraps over your, yeah. your float. But uh, I get into trouble sometimes, especially on windy days. But you're, you're working on the old adage, the more bait in the water, the more fish? Uh, you need an attractor too sometimes, yeah, yeah, what yeah. we call burley. Yeah, yeah. So how, how would you make your burley? Uh, that's made of chopped up weed or cabbage and placed with uh, wet sand, mixed up pretty well, and periodically a handful into your fishing zone. Mm, nice. And uh, as the flow into the into the zone, as yeah. you're saying, as the float's going, we've got a couple more implements here on the table. I know they're not to do with floats, but they're very uh, traditional blackfish um, implements here. These are the um, center pin reels. Uh, they're a tradi t traditional um, reel, aren't they? They are. Uh, the black one is what they call the steel light, and it goes back. Well, at least into the 50s, early 50s. Um, and the other one there, the aluminium, is more to the newer style. Uh, a lot of work and very free-running type reel. And I'd imagine very light. Very light. Yes. So obviously you've got some orange-looking uh, fluoro on this one. You've got some uh, yellow on that one. I know I, on mine at home, I've got some pink. I mean, that's where the technology is now, yeah. isn't it, in the actual line? The aluminium reel, as you can see, that has a float line on it from Japan. And it's uh, the name is Dango Wax. And that's an 18-pound breaking strain line. And that's uh, used a lot because it wants to. You'd like to sit it on top of the top water. Top of the water. Yeah. So you don't want your line to sink. To sink. To assist that, uh, if you haven't got a float line, I usually um, use bee wax. Yeah. Not Vaseline. I have to put on the line. Yeah. But these days, uh, all myriad colours like this old steel light reel, um, probably you know, could be upwards of the could be upwards of 80 years old, and uh, now it's got some very very high tech line on it. It probably, <laughs> it probably doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. But uh, what we'll finish with is we'll just um, take you up. Uh, we'll take you up to uh, Warwick's uh, bench here, <laughs> and we'll just uh, very quickly show you how these uh, floats get uh, tuned down um, we're not going to make a float here because there's some uh, secret herbs and spices here that <laughs> Warren wants to keep but um, we'll um, we'll jump up on his bench now and we'll have a bit of a look yeah what we'll do Les is to uh, I'll put a single cork uh, one on and just run it down to the finished shape which won't take long okay let's do that so we're up at the bench now, uh, Warwick, and uh, here's your no expense spared on the, the uh, implement here. This is a, an old electric drill for one of yours. Yes, that's what it is, an old Black & Decker drill. Uh, this one, it's at least over 10 years old, and uh, it's turned many of a float. And, uh, and then you just got uh, chucked into there a little bit of uh, like a, a uh, bit of... A stainless steel mandrel with a build-up of glue and timber, which is quite handy to push onto. After drilling the cork, nice. I'll now switch on. Ready? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So as you can see, Warwick's just basically 
pushing it on there and he's just Just using different uh, size sandpapers, I'd imagine, over time. Yeah. This is the coarse sandpaper. Yeah. Gets, a, gets it down to the size, and then you use some finer, do you, too? I will. Yeah, nice. Now I change to a medium. And finish off with a very fine. So when we say handmade, we mean handmade here, Warwick. We do. So we just returned to the table. We've actually got uh, this particular one that w Warwick was just working on, on the makeshift uh, lathe there. Uh, very, very uh, smooth. And uh, so the next process would potentially just, uh, as you can see there, you get yourself the, uh, the bamboo, which is already heat shrunk at the bottom here. And, uh, of course, you just apply the float. Uh, the right way up I'd imagine. So you got yourself the start of a nice little float so look we appreciate the time uh, work to be down in your garage today part of this quest of mine is to you know as I said bring a bit of knowledge I mean traditionally the uh, Ludric fishing is there's a fair bit of secrecy involved and I understand that people you know want to keep their spots they want to keep where they get their bait they want to keep all that knowledge but I feel that if we don't start sharing some of that soon, then uh, there's going to be a lot, a lot of um, information lost. There will be, Les. Um, one of the most secrets, not only spots, is where do you get your bait? Yes. Oh, this question's asked right throughout the internet. You know, hey, mate, where would you get your bait? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where technology will probably solve that question as well i know you and i are both having a bit of a flutter with uh some of the handmade uh flies um trying to work out you know how they might work and what conditions they might work and all that sort of stuff so um but yes uh nothing will replace the live bait i don't think no neither do i but it is one of those things and uh, hopefully uh in the down the track uh if uh, the Ludwig Nation goes the way I want it to, we'll be able to pinpoint places of weed and, and cabbage and stuff because there is enough to go around, isn't there? There, there is enough at times. Uh, weather is the issue there with bait collecting, uh, especially off the rocks where it can be very dangerous. And also a good uh, wave break will wash any good bait away too at times. And uh, one of the things that we need to be careful of is making sure that people are safe. They're, they're obviously, there's a lot of ludric fishing done on the, the rocks at the ocean. There is. And there's uh, some new rules around all that. I'm not going to go into those at the moment. But if you're doing that and you're on the rocks, uh, please be safe. I think, Warwick, you and I, we'd rather be on an inlet somewhere, on a nice uh, flat rock somewhere. A nice bit of armchair fishing. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, we're, we're not young anymore. But uh, I tell you what, we do uh, want to bring uh, some knowledge to the younger people. So appreciate your time. And uh, we're going to uh, finish off. Uh, we might um, 
we might uh, just uh, pack all this stuff up and uh, we might even go out for a fish sometime soon. I'm sure we will, Les. Yes. And thank you for the opportunity to share the experience that I've got. And as you said, we hope we can get through to that younger fisherman. And I put the quest out there as, as thank you to Warwick. And I put the quest out there. If you've got some information that you'd like to uh, share the Ludwig Nation, well, get in touch with me. Um, I'm going to be putting all of our uh, posts and information up onto a new YouTube channel. And uh, we can share all that. And that's where the young people are is on yeah. the YouTube. So anyhow, Warwick, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Les.